So long as these problems are not solved, so long as ignorance and poverty remain on earth, these words cannot be useless. These are the words which preface the seventh and final broadcast based on Victor Hugo's great novel, Les Miserables. WOR and the Mutual Network present Orson Welles, distinguished young author, actor, and director, in an adaptation of the book which he has created especially for radio. Each episode portrays some development in the progress of Jean Valjean, a role played by Orson Welles, who is also heard as he reads the narrative passages. Part 7, the final episode of Les Miserables. In Paris, on the 16th of February, 1833, there was celebrated the marriage of Cosette Fauchelevent to Marius Pomercy. The date of the wedding was Mardi Gras, and the ceremonies were held in a city gay with flowers and merrymaking. The bride's father, Monsieur Fauchelevent, having suffered a severe accident to his arm, was not present. Father, how good to see you. We missed you yesterday, but you've really come too early. Cosette is still asleep, but I can tell you the news. You are to come and live with us. It has all been decided. You are part of our happiness, Father. Cosette and I insist you share it with us. Monsieur. Is anything wrong? Is your arm still troubling you? There is nothing wrong with my arm. Is it wise for you to take the bandage off so soon? There has never been anything wrong with it. You can see for yourself. But, but yesterday you... You didn't come to our wedding. It was because you hurt your hand. It was the best that I should be absent from your marriage. Your pardon, Father, I... I don't know what you're talking about. Marius, I'm a convict. I've been in the galleys. The galleys? You? Cosette's father? Before God, I am not the father of Cosette. I am a peasant of Favarole, and my name is not Fauchelevent. It is Jean Valjean. That is true, monsieur. I believe you. Cosette is... Very dear to me, but... Well, ten years, I... I didn't know Cosette existed ten years ago. I am, after all, a passerby in her life. And today, our roads separate. She is now Madame Pomercy. I can do nothing for her. I leave her to your care, monsieur. But you could have kept your secret. No one would have known. Perhaps not, monsieur. But I shall always know. You think... I might have been happy with you. I... Have I the right to be happy? Suppose I remain, Monsieur Fauchelevent. I come to stay with you. I... We are together. And some fine day, while we're laughing and chatting, you hear a voice shout, Jean Valjean, and the police spring out of the shadow and tear off my mask. What then? Father. Father, dearest. I've missed you so. Uh, Cosette, uh, we, uh, we're talking of business. Father, you're pale. Does your arm hurt you? It is well. What is it, then? Are you sad? No. Then kiss me. That's better. Now I shall stay. Uh, Cosette, darling, uh, we have something to finish. You still want me to go? Very well, I shall. But don't be long, please. <coughs> Poor Cosette. You must not tell her about me. I entreat you, monsieur. Cosette doesn't know what this world is. The world of the convict and the galleys. Promise me that she shall never know. I will keep your secret. Thank you, monsieur. Uh, it is all nearly finished. There is one thing left. What? You think, monsieur, you think I should not see Cosette again? I think it would be for the best. Yes. Yes. Very well, monsieur. I shall not see her again. Jean Valjean was a convict. But the bridegroom, Marius, did not know the story of his crimes. There are many crimes, and hunger was one of these in the year of our Lord, 1796. Jean Valjean, before you are sentenced, have you nothing to say to this court? I was hungry, that's all, Excellency. My sister, she and her little ones, we live at Favarol, Excellency. I, I'm, a, I'm a proner. In the season, I earn 18 sous a day, and, and that's all. It's very hard, Excellency, and they're all hungry, Excellency. 
Much more hungry than me. Prisoner, this court finds, proven finally against you, the crime for which you are on trial, namely the burglary of a loaf of bread. Excellency, what does that mean? It means you're a thief. Guilty. Five years in the galleys. The galleys. Five years at the oar of a prison ship. Five years for his first offense. Jean Valjean, thief. Guilty. Attempted escape. Guilty. Prisoner, sentence extended. Three years. Jean Valjean, thief. Guilty. Escape in the second attempt. Guilty. Prisoner, sentence extended. Three years. Jean Valjean, thief. Guilty. Escape in the third attempt. Guilty. Prisoner, sentence extended. Three years. Jean Valjean, thief. Guilty. Escape in the first, second, and third attempts. Guilty. Escape in the fourth attempt and resist it. Guilty. Prisoner, sentence extended in the double chain. Five years. Jean Valjean, your term has expired. Here is your passport. Give it to me. I can read. I, I've, I've learned to read. Let me look at it. The bearer is a liberated convict, having been 19 years in the galleys for stealing a loaf of bread. Original sentence, five years. Additional servitude, 14 years. The holder of this passport is a very dangerous man. Excellency, what does that mean? It means you're free. <laughs> What had been the life of this soul? In weariness, in agony, under the whip, under the chain, in the cell, on the convict's bed of plank, under the burning sun of the galleys, Jean Valjean turned to his conscience and reflected. Human society had done him nothing but injury. He had no weapon but his hate. He had resolved to sharpen it in the galleys, and he had taken it with him when he went out. So the passport was right. The yellow passport, which described Jean Valjean as a very dangerous man. It was right that October night in 1815. Come in. Come in, monsieur. Shut the door. Listen to me. Listen to me. I'm a convict. You hear that? Four days ago, they, they let me out. I've, I've walked all the way from Toulon. I've been 19 years in the galleries. Look, I have money. I'll, I'll pay you. Sit down, monsieur. Make yourself comfortable. Wait, wait. Did you hear what I said? I, I said I was a convict. What is this place? It's not an inn. Is this your house? No. No, this is not my house. It is the house of Christ. What are you? A priest? Aren't you afraid of me? No, monsieur. Aren't you afraid of me? Eighteen fifteen. Another crime of Jean Valjean's, of which Marius knew nothing. A crime committed that October night, eighteen years before, in the house of the Bishop of Dives. It was the bishop himself who opened the door that night to the convict, Jean Valjean. He made a place for him at his table and gave him a bed in his best chamber. The first bed Jean Valjean had slept in for 19 years. And Jean Valjean lay in his bed, sleepless, all through that long October night. He had many thoughts. He thought first of the goodness of the bishop of D and then thought of his silver, the bishop's silver, six silver plates. He had seen them at dinner, 200 francs worth of silver, double his pay for 19 years' labor in the chains. It is true that he stole them. It is true that Jean Valjean stole the plates from the bishop of D. It is true that he sold these plates for 200 francs and that he used this money to make himself rich. Under the name of Madeleine in the district of Montreux, he set up a workshop for the manufacture of synthetic jet. He prospered. He built a great factory. He became mayor of the city. It is true that Jean Valjean did this 
with the six silver plates he stole that night from the Bishop of Dee. It is true also that Jean Valjean was never convicted of this crime. Yes, monsieur. We are the police, monseigneur. Please, officer. Silence, prisoner. Monseigneur, this man has been apprehended on the highway in the criminal possession of your plate. Good morning, Valjean. You recognize him, monseigneur. That is enough. Here is your silver. Yes, but where are my candlesticks? Here are the stolen plates, monseigneur. Were there candlesticks also? Oh, yes. They are of silver like the rest. Valjean, where are my candlesticks? I didn't take them. Monsieur Valjean, I don't think you understood. I gave you the candlesticks as well. What... What do you mean? Monseigneur, the, the prisoner was running off with your plate. And he told you that they were given him by an old priest with whom he had lodged the night. And you brought him here. Yes, Monseigneur. Then... Oh, then it's true what he told me? I have given him the silver. Then we can let him go? Of course. But... But it, they aren't mine. Monsieur, the plates and the candlesticks are yours. Take them. But never forget you have promised me to use this silver to become an honest man. I... I have promised you? Jean Valjean, I have purchased your soul. I withdraw it from the spirit of perversity. And I give it to Almighty God. Jean Valjean ran out of the city and made haste into the open country. A little gypsy boy passed by him and dropped a penny. Jean Valjean put his foot on the penny and ran after the boy. But he never found him. Another crime. He knew then that he must either conquer or be conquered. It was after this that Jean Valjean, the poor farmer who became a galley slave, established himself in Montreux as Monsieur Madeleine, the owner of a great factory and a public official. So Jean Valjean was sentenced forever to a new life. And a miracle was worked in his soul by the Bishop of D. Marius knew the father of his bride, Monsieur Fauchelevent, and it came to be that he found out the convict, Jean Valjean. But Marius never heard of the wealthy manufacturer, Monsieur Madeleine, the inventor of a process for the manufacture of imitation jet, the public benefactor, the mayor of Montreux who, like Fauchelevent, was Jean Valjean. In 1823, this Madeleine was a quiet, hopeful man with but two thoughts in his heart, to conceal his name and to sanctify his life, to escape from men and to return to God. But even in 1823, Jean Valjean was wanted by the police, and there came a dark day in that year when they thought they had him. Certainly a man who looked like Jean Valjean was arrested and accused of Jean Valjean's crime, the theft of a penny, and certainly Jean Valjean, known as Madeleine, attended this man's trial. Monsieur Madeleine. Your honor, the judge. Your note was sent in to me, monsieur. Permit me to say that your presence in this court is an unexpected compliment. Oh, thanks. Uh, will you sit here, Monsieur Madeleine? We will resume the trial. Your Excellency, the judge. Your honor, Monsieur Madeleine, gentlemen of the jury. Who is this man? He is Jean Valjean. Accused of one crime for which he is on trial, but he is wanted for another. Highway robbery committed for the gain of one penny from a small boy encountered on the fields outside of D. Convict this Jean Valjean, and he shall be tried again. What does the man say for himself? May I question him? Why, if it will interest you, Monsieur Madeleine. Thank you. Monsieur Valjean, how long have you been a pruner? His honor is speaking to you, prisoner. Reply to him. I don't know, monsieur. My name isn't Valjean. Look here, I, I'm, I'm telling the truth. You have only to ask if it isn't so. Ask how stupid I am. <laughs> ask him. I, I don't know what you want of me. <laughs> Officers, in force order, I am about to pronounce sentence on this man. One moment. Your Excellency. Your Excellency, may I be permitted a few words? On behalf of the accused, I'd like to tell you about Jean Valjean. Why, certainly, Monsieur Madeleine. Excellency, they were right when they told you that Jean Valjean was an outlaw. It's true he was a galley slave. It's true he was a criminal. The pennies were stolen, and the loaf of bread, and the bishop was robbed. But mark you, gentlemen, the galleys... Make the galley slave. 
This man was a poor peasant, an idiot. He was changed in the galleys. He was stupid. He was made wicked. He was saved later by indulgence and kindness. As he was lost by severity. You won't understand this. There are some things which... which cannot be told. I cannot relate to you the story of Jean Valjean's life. Someday you will know it. He has done what he could. He has disguised himself under another name. He has desired to enter again amongst honest men. It seems this cannot be. Gentlemen, your prisoner is not he who is on trial before you. Release this man. He is innocent. Gentlemen, I am Jean Valjean. Jean Valjean, you are charged with concealing your identity and changing your name. How do you plead? Guilty. Jean Valjean, you are sentenced to hard labor in the galleys under the double chain for the rest of your life. But Jean Valjean escaped from the galleys that same year and was never retaken. He was hunted. For 11 years, he lived in the shadows, cowering. Sometimes no more than a step from the terrible creature who pursued him, the policeman, Javert. But now Javert was no more. Small comfort now. Cosette was no more. She belonged to another. She whose childhood was passed in his sight like a summer's day. Whose cares were his only care. Whose joys were his only joy. Who shared with him his only happiness in a long lifetime of misery. Who owned his heart and a whole lifetime of love. Her he had given up. Totally. He was wealthy. He relinquished wealth. He was free. He relinquished freedom. We have seen Jean Valjean give up the world to save a man from the galleys. The cost was not so great to him as this. I have purchased your soul. I withdraw it from the spirit of perversity, and I give it to Almighty God. We have seen many things happen to Jean Valjean of which Marius and even Cosette never learned. We have seen crimes which Marius judged without knowing, and more than that, we have beheld the resurrection and transfiguration of a human soul. We know the story without retelling it of Cosette's mother. We have seen Jean Valjean's Fauchelevent, the father of Cosette, and we have seen him at the barricades, saving Marius from the insurrection so that Marius could take Cosette from him. We have seen him dragging Marius through the hideous muck of the Paris sewers and into safety. It is only important to remember here that Marius was unconscious, that Marius knew nothing of the manner of his rescue and never dreamt that Jean Valjean or Monsieur Fauchelevent was his savior. During the months which followed, Jean Valjean came no longer to the house where Marius Pontmercy lived with his wife Cosette in the Rue de Cabler. But shopkeepers in the neighborhood noticed that every day an old man dressed in black came towards that street. When there were but a few houses left between him and this street, this street which appeared to attract him, his pace became so slow that at times it appeared as if he ceased to move. And when he reached the street, he stopped, trembled, put his head with a kind of gloomy timidity beyond the corner of the last house and looked into the street. There was in that tragic look something which resembled the bewilderment of the impossible and the reflection of a forbidden paradise. He remained thus a few minutes as if he had been stoned. Later, the old man ceased to go as far as this corner and then one day... He did not appear. Jean Valjean was very ill. Come in. Father. Cosette. Cosette. <laughs> Is it you, Cosette? Father, where have you been? Why have you left us so long? Oh. So you're here, Monsieur Marius. Do you forgive me? Forgive you? He asked me to forgive him. After what he has done for me. Monsieur, 
I have done nothing for you. Nothing? You saved my life. You must be mistaken, monsieur. I was mistaken, but not now. Perhaps you've forgotten a certain coachman. A coachman who drove you through the streets of Paris during the fighting. He has told me everything. Marius, what do you mean? But for your father, I wouldn't be alive today. My darling, he was the man. That barricade, the sewer, he went through it for me, for you, Cosette. He bore me through death in every form. Why have you not told it before? I... I told the truth. No, not the whole truth. I owe my life to you. Father, your hands are colder. Are you suffering? No, no. I am not suffering. I... On the contrary, my little one, I'm very well, only... Only what, Father? I shall die in a few minutes. Father! Hmm. It is nothing to die. It is frightful not to live. Father, here, we will help you. Cosette, he must lie down. Now, oh. children, children, I want you to listen to me. This money belongs to you. I've written you a letter about it. 600,000 francs. Every penny earned honestly from the jet factory at Montreux. I shall have lost my life if you do not enjoy it. You see, the black jet comes from England. And the white jet comes from Norway. You, you understand then how much money can be made. And, and then the class must be bent, not sodded. It's all written out. There. Now come closer. Come closer, both of you. Father. You'll weep for me a little. Not too much. You must amuse yourselves a great deal, my children. Twelve dozen cost only ten francs and sell for sixteen. And that's really a good business. And you can be rich without concern. You'll find my letter, Cosette. I've written it all down to you. And, Cosette, I bequeath the two candlesticks. There, on the mantel. They are silver, but to me they are gold. They are diamond. They were given me by the... by the good Bishop of D. I wonder... will he be satisfied with me... in heaven? I've done what I could. Father, do you want a priest? No. No. I have one. He had fallen backward. The light from those silver candlesticks, the candlesticks of the Bishop of D, fell upon him. His white face looked up toward heaven. He let Cosette and Marius cover his hands with kisses. For Jean Valjean was dead. That night was starless and very dark. It is certain but in that gloom, some mighty angel was standing with outstretched wings, awaiting this soul. Jean Valjean, I have purchased your soul. I withdraw it from the spirit of perversity, and I give it to Almighty God. <laughs> W.O.R. and the Mutual Network have brought you the seventh and final episode of Les Miserables. Orson Welles, distinguished young author, actor, and director, played the role of Jean Valjean and was also heard reading the narrative passages. Assisting Mr. Welles were Frank Reddick as the bishop, William Johnstone as Marius, Virginia Wells as Cosette, and Ray Collins and Hiram Sherman. W.O.R. and the Mutual Network have taken great pleasure in bringing to its listeners this unusual radio version of one of the world's great stories, the credit for which is due to everyone who participated in the production.
This is the Coast to Coast Network of the Mutual Broadcasting System.